Well, that would have been quite the hazing if Spencer had told me that the evening worship was at 6 o'clock this evening. I wouldn't have put that past him. He's quite the troublemaker. But truly, my uh, cup is overflowing with joy tonight to uh, be with you and to have this opportunity to preach the Word of God. I can honestly say that Sarah and I have been at a lot of great congregations before, uh, but this is one of the first uh, congregations that we can truly say that we feel uh, we need the church here more than the church needs us. And we have not always uh, had that feeling, and we're glad and blessed to uh, take part in that sort of a, a feeling about the church. It really is a joy. Before we uh, get into the Word of God tonight, uh, Brother uh, Corey Collins asked me to introduce myself and my family a little bit, so I'm going to take a moment uh, to do that. Uh, first of all, I was born in Virginia Beach, but I was raised in central Wisconsin. And yes, that means I am a cheesehead. And yes, that means I am a Packer fan. I know that the Apostle Paul said that I ought to become all things, all men. Maybe I ought to put on that cowboy hat, but you know, the Apostle Paul also said that we ought to uh, be content whatever state we are and we ought to remain in the state that we were called. So I plan on remaining a Packer fan. You should also know that uh, I was not uh, raised among a Christian family. Uh, my great-grandmother took me in when I was five years old, and she was not a Christian, but she taught me a lot of great principles while I was growing up. Now, that didn't keep me from uh, getting into trouble when I was a teenager, uh, but when I was 17 years old, I sought the Lord's path. I sought His way and His church. I literally opened up a yellow uh, pages book I looked up the uh, church and I made a phone call and the preacher answered and I asked him if it was a non-denominational church and he said, well, kind of, sort of. And I invited him to a Bible study uh, to my house. You heard that right. I invited him to a Bible study in my house and without delay, uh, he came over and soon thereafter, I was added to the Lord's church. Uh, then a few years later, I decided to enter the preaching ministry uh, about that same time, my great-grandmother at 86 years old was also uh, baptized. And so then I uh, went to the, attended the Southwest School of Bible Studies, and there I also met my wife. She didn't like me too much uh, in the beginning, but my great-grandmother also told me and taught me about perseverance. So uh, eventually she buckled and she said yes, and uh, soon after graduation we married and we moved out west to work with a small church in uh, Tucson, Arizona. Unfortunately, the church there was uh, given over to a great uh, deal of liberalism, and so we uh, moved back up north to my hometown congregation in Marshfield, Wisconsin, uh, and we worked with a, a small church just 45 minutes outside of the town there. Unfortunately, the small church there was kind of struggling. Uh, it was a, a small congregation, and so by their recommendation, and also a uh, a fellow preacher who actually preaches in Texas. Some of, them you might, some of you might be familiar with him. Uh, his name is Stan Crowley. And he recommended a, a congregation just outside the D.C. area. And so uh, we moved out there, and there was a, a good, uh, strong eldership there. And, and my wife and I, we found uh, stability. That's what we were looking for, some stability to grow uh, as a young couple. And so for the next five years, we worked with that congregation. But within that span of time, then we had... Uh, two very beautiful uh, little girls, and we decided, well, it was time to move a little closer to the grandparents, and uh, they happened to be living and currently are living just outside the San Antonio area. And funny enough, uh, before I had left school, I said to myself, I will never step foot in Texas to preach the gospel. And that's right, you heard me. I said, I will never step foot in Texas to preach the gospel again. Not because I don't love Texas. I absolutely love and adore Texas. Uh, but having been up north, uh, having had my experience, uh, you know, I just, is a little hot for me, first of all. And then second of all, uh, you know, it just seemed like there was a church on every corner. And so I said, I'll never preach in Texas again. And then the Lord spoke to Jonah and he said, arise and go to Keller, Texas. 
And so my wife and I were brought here. And, and unlike Jonah, however, we plan on staying here a long time. Uh, we hope to do that. And uh, we hope to uh, build our little family here and work with the great uh, congregation that's down here. All right, well, that gives you a little background on me. And so now uh, let's go ahead and, and open uh, to the Word of God. How does the church win back the young? Well, that question, of course, implies that there is a consensus, that there is a decline in young people today who are attending and who are active in the Lord's church. And I think that most of us would probably say that there is definitely uh, some truth to that. Uh, and there's a reason to be concerned about that. Now, overall, you might say that really there's a decline everywhere across the board. Uh, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the Lord's Church or we're talking about the Catholic Church or we're talking about uh, some Protestant denomination. There just seems to be overall a decline, at least in terms of uh, congregating together and, and corporate worship and, and being part of a, a quote, organized religion. And so there seems to be a decline everywhere, but it's especially concerning to us, I think, and it ought to be when we think about our young people. Because when we think about our young people, we're essentially talking about the church of tomorrow. Now, I believe the young people are the church of today also, but also they are the church of tomorrow. And it seems logical to me that if a congregation is functioning at a 400, 500 member level, and the next generation is only going to be about 30 or 40 or 50. How do you sustain that kind of a work? How do you sustain the kind of facilities and the kind of activities that uh, that previous generation is putting all that effort into? Logically, it just cannot be done. And so there ought to be a greater concern in, in some measure when we think about the decline in our young people. And so it is cause for concern. I won't, bear, I won't bore you, I should say, with... Uh, long statistics because you know how statistics can be sometimes sometimes they ought they, they really tend to contradict uh, one another at times and then uh, other times when we're looking at statistics uh, it doesn't seem like there's always a thorough uh, well done research into the matter and so I don't always like to depend too much on statistics but overall again when we go to these things it seems like there is decline it seems like we're hearing numbers like uh, maybe only 60 percent are staying faithful or 40 percent or 50 percent now I say that even a little bit cringing uh, in my teeth because I think that there needs to be better more uh, thorough research uh, done into those kind of statistics it was kind of eye-opening one time uh, when I heard a preacher who had kind of uh, studied and researched and, and removed some of the excess, you could say. He, he looked into congregations that uh, were hard line and, and rigid, and then he looked at congregations that were very uh, denominational in their flavor, and he kind of separated them from the, the statistics and the research that was done. And he just looked at sound, faithful, biblical, loving churches. And actually, the statistics were somewhat surprising. I believe that man said that the young people in those congregations, the congregations we read about in Revelation 2 and 3, those faithful congregations, the rate and percentage of faithfulness tend to be about 75%. That means three out of every four of those young people were actually staying faithful. And so sometimes when we back up and we kind of uh, do our research the way we ought to do it, sometimes those numbers uh, look a lot different. And I think we ought to consider those things. But at the same time, the reality remains that if we lose one young person, we have lost too many. And so we need to be like Jesus, that great shepherd who, when he sees that one lost sheep astray, he leaves that 99 and he goes for that one lost sheep. He cares a lot about them. And so regardless of what the statistics are, regardless of the decline and what the feel and the mood is today concerning uh, our young people, we still need to be caring and thinking about our young people and how to win back each and every one of them. So how do we win back the youth? Well, I want to begin by talking just a little bit about how we don't win back the youth. How not to win back the youth. Do you want to know how to lose the youth forever? 
Become as much a part of the world as you possibly can. Take the church and pour it into uh, like uh, uh, milk and sugar in a, in, a, in a cup of coffee. Pour it into that cup of coffee. Stir it up, you know, and, and, and just like those frappuccinos and cappuccinos that continue to identify themselves as coffee, but really they're more like a, a dessert drink or something like that. They might taste fine, but they're, but they're really not coffee. Take the church like that. Take it just like that and pour it into the world and blend it in as much as you possibly can and that is a good way to lose the youth forever. The proof. You say, how, how do I know that to be sure, Dan? How do I know that uh, maybe you're just kind of a, a, a square young buck and you know you just you, you like things done a certain way and, you, and you're really not up with the uh, modern and contemporary? What's the proof? Well, the proof in part is that I actually do like. I'm a young person. I like contemporary. I like what is modern. I like what is new. I like to go to the, the computer stores and I like uh, something that's new. I like the new HD screens. I like to, the, the new adventure rides. I, I, I like uh, all the newest technology. I like all those things. I like those things. It's not that I like to distance myself from things. It's not like I have an affinity or attraction constantly toward those things that are old. I like new things. But the problem is when we think about the church becoming like the world, always doing what is new, always uh, on the up and up, the problem is that the world is always going to do a little bit better. The world's always going to do better. They're always going to uh, have a little bit more money than we do. They're always going to have more numbers than we do. The church says, you know, we got to have this big football size uh, mega screen. I like the screens up here, but, you know, uh, a church today might say we need to have the biggest possible screen because that's going to pull in the young people today in our five by ten little auditorium. We need to have the biggest one possible. And the world looks at that and says, I can do five or six of those football size. I can do a million of those and I can do them way better than you can. And I know some of you probably heard this before, but I want you to really think about this. Because when the church says, we're going to become as much as the world as we possibly can, we're going to do what the world is doing, we're going to try to blend in with the world, and, and we're just going to try to incorporate those things into the church and, and, bring back, and, and bring the young people back that way, the young people look at those things and they say, well, I can go to a better coffee shop, or I, I, I can get a bigger, be, bigger and better screen and go see those things. The world won't be pulled back, or the church won't be uh, winning the youth that way. Because the young people look at those things and, and they feel shortchanged. You know, I go to the computer store and I see a $50 computer and I see a $500 computer. Oh yes, that $50 computer might look attractive to me. It's kind of cheap, but I'm wondering to myself, that $500 computer, I wonder what I'm getting with that $500 computer. I wonder what, about all the things that I'm possibly missing out when I, when I don't buy that $500 computer. And the young people see that today and they look at all the things that uh, some of the churches trying to incorporate and they say, I, I know things that are way better than this. I see things out there that are way better than that. I'm going to go check out those things instead. When the church decides to become as much as the world as they possibly can, that's a good way to lose the youth forever. What I'm getting at is the church just simply can't compete with the world in worldly things. When the church tries to compete with the world, uh, with worldly warfare, the church immediately loses. The church immediately becomes a loser and the world immediately becomes a winner because the church can't compete with those worldly things. When the church tries to pull out its sword like Peter did and he pulls out that sword, every once in a while the church might be able to catch an ear here and there, no pun intended, but he might be able to catch a little bit there, a little bit here. But just like Jesus said, Live by the sword, die by the sword. The church lives by the world, the church dies by the world. The Apostle John said that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. We can't compete with the world on worldly, uh, on worldly uh, battlegrounds. The only way the church is going to win is if we fight them on a different kind of battleground. How to win back the youth. Let me give you two passages here in your Bible. First of all, turn over to Ephesians chapter 4 with me. Keep your bar marker there, your finger. Ephesians chapter 4, and then we're also going to look at 1 John 
chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 4 and 1 John chapter 2. And I'm going to give you two passages here that I want you to think about this evening when we think about how we can win back the youth. We lose them if we try to make the church as much like the world as we possibly can, but we can win them if we follow the instructions the Apostle Paul had for the Ephesian church and the Apostle John had for the church worldwide. And I believe these instructions are not just instructions for uh, how the church may grow in terms of the youth, but really it's how the church can grow uh, worldwide, how the church can win souls despite the, uh, the sex, the nationality, the ethnicity, the, even the attitudes and the personalities that sometimes uh, become a barrier uh, between us and others. How can the church win souls? But specifically tonight, how can the church win back those young souls? Well, I want you to listen to what Paul says in verse 15. Speaking in the present tense, he says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Catch that first part. Speaking the truth. How can the church win back young people today? The church can win back the young by speaking the truth. Hold your finger there. And turn over 1 John chapter 2, as I mentioned a moment ago. And 1 John chapter 2, listen to what the apostle uh, John has to say to these young people. In verse 13, he says, I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I've written to you, fathers, because you've known him who is from the beginning. And listen again. He says, I've written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Someone told these young people about sin. Someone told these young people to overcome sin. Someone told these young people that the God whom they were worshiping was not a God at all, but was just simply the imaginations of the minds of men. Someone told these young people, stop worshiping these false gods and start worshiping the true God. Someone told these young people that they were living in sin and they needed to get out. Someone told these young people about sexual morality, about uh, drunkenness and, and substance abuse and all of these things. Someone told these young people that their lives were in sin and that they were engaged with a spiritual warfare against Satan. Someone told these young people that Satan was waging a war against their souls and that he was trying to overcome them with sin and trying to enslave them in sin. And someone told these young people, you can overcome through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can overcome the wicked one. Someone told these young people, Endure the hardship of Jesus Christ. Someone told these young people, fight the good fight of faith. Someone told these young people, repent, turn away from sin, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Someone told these young people to overcome the wicked one. Someone told these young people that they could not see, but in this invisible realm, there were clashing angels and demons, and they were fighting for their souls, and that they, some were trying to tempt them, and others were trying to lead them to righteousness. Someone told these young people that they were engaged in this great spiritual warfare. But through Jesus Christ, they could overcome. Young people want to fight today. You know, when young people today are told, all you have to do is believe in Jesus. That's all you have to do. And you're eternally saved forever and ever. You don't have to ever worry about losing your soul. You just have to believe in Jesus. You know what young people do? They say, okay, they put that in their back pot and they go on to the next challenge. Because young people by nature are radical. Young people by nature are revolutionary. You know how many 50 and 60 and 70 year old people change the world? Not many. Not many. Martin Luther... That Reformation leader was only about in his 20s. A lot of people don't know that, but he was only about his 20s when he led that movement. Alexander the Great, you've heard that name before, conquered the world before he was 30 years old. Jesus, God used Jesus when he was about 30 years old to save the world. 
Young people are looking for a challenge. They're looking for an obstacle. And when people today tell them, well, uh, Christianity is just this easy. It, it, this is all you have to do and there's nothing else more to it. It's no wonder that our young people are leaving the church. As far as they're concerned, they've won the battle. There's nothing else left to do in Christianity. Why am I here? Why stay here? There's no fight. There's no obstacle. Young people by nature want to fight. They want a challenge. They want an obstacle. They want to hear sermons like uh, Brother Corey Collins preaching this morning. That that path to heaven is narrow. That is difficult. But through Jesus Christ, you can overcome. Young people want to hear those kind of sermons preached. Because young people are looking for a challenge. They're looking for an obstacle to overcome. How can you and I win the young people back today to the church? Tell them the truth. Tell them the truth about sin. Tell them the truth about Jesus Christ. Tell them the truth about the state and the condition of the religious world today. Tell them that Satan has his sway over the, over the world today and that the majority of what people believe today, the majority of, uh, of where people are walking today is the wrong path. It's not the right path, but the right path is among the few. Tell people about that young, that narrow path, that difficult path. And young people will rise up for the challenge. They'll rise up because they want the obstacle. They want the difficulty. Notice something else, though, in our passage. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. That's the first part. We need to speak the truth to them, but notice the second part. The Apostle Paul says in the present tense, speaking the truth. You continue to do this. You continue to speak the truth to them in love. Speak the truth in love. We turn back again to 2 John, or 1 John, excuse me, 1 John chapter 2. And listen again to what John writes in verse 12. He says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Too many of us today think to ourselves, you know, those young people are just young and innocent. They don't have any sin in their life. They couldn't have done anything wrong, anything uh, regrettable in their life. They can't really know the pains of, of guilt and, and shame. When I was growing up in my hometown in Marshfield, Wisconsin, I was about 13 or 14 years old when I uh, went into my freshman year and immediately it didn't take me long to get ca caught up with the wrong crowd and you know I got involved in some sins and some ways of life that would just bring tears to my eyes tonight if I began to talk to you at length about those things young people today know what guilt and shame is and a lot of them today walk around with that guilt and shame and they don't talk to anyone about them because, you know, we're just those, those young people. We, we really can't measure up to the kind of sins and the kind of uh, lifestyle that other people have been in before. And, and, and they kind of even sometimes minimize their own guilt and shame. And they just kind of walk around with it, never exposing, never telling anyone about it. But the reality is that burden of guilt and shame weighs down more heavily upon them than most of us who are older and adults. And instead of telling and confessing others about it, instead of asking for help, you know what they do? They, they tend to let the world feed more into that sin with addiction, obsession, uh, sexual immorality, whatever it might be. They let the world, because the world has no remedy for sin. The world offers sin, but it has no remedy. And so these young people, they continue to let the world feed into their sin because that's all the world can offer them. The world offers sin, but no remedy. And so they walk around with this guilt and this shame, and they never tell anyone about the struggles that they're going through. They never tell anyone about the sins that are in their life. The world offers sin, but no remedy. Many of our young people today, I believe, deep down inside are crying out just like the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I think there's a lot of young people out there today who have zero guidance in how to handle their sin, what to do about their sin, how to overcome the guilt and the shame that weighs down upon them. 
When the Apostle John wrote to these little children, these young people, he reminded them that their sins were forgiven. You know how the church can win back the young people today? By speaking to them about the truth in love and telling them about the forgiveness that Jesus Christ our Lord offers to them. That Jesus offers a remedy. That Jesus offers a path to their life that can wipe away all of the guilt and, and all of the shame. It can, he can wipe it all away and he can make that conscience clean again. When you're baptized and you place your trust in Christ Jesus. And those sins that those young people deep down inside hold and hide, they can feel confidence one again to lift up their head, to see the sunlight again, to walk in confidence and boldness and faith. Turn over with me real quick to Psalm 25. This is the other scripture we're going to just briefly look at here. But I want you to see something in Psalm 25. Listen to, listen to what David sings in this psalm. You probably sang a song. It might remind you uh, when you read this verse. But remember what David said in Psalm 25, verse 7? Do not remember the sins of my youth. Oh, I think there was something in David's life especially when he was in his younger years, he could look back and, oh, the shame, the guilt that he felt, all, the, all the, the things that he did when he was a young person, all the ridiculous things, all the shameful things. God, please, remember not the sins of my youth. David was pleading for that forgiveness. He wanted those things to be removed in his life. Look at Psalm 25, same, same psalm. Look at what he says in verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he teaches sinners in the way. God can show our young people today the right path for their life. He can help them clear their conscience, remove the guilt and the shame of sin, and he can provide that path to eternal life and a true life, to a rewarding and joyful life. Church, sin doesn't discriminate. You know one of the reasons why I think we see those demons in the New Testament and they're overcoming those young people because those demons remind us sin doesn't discriminate. Sin doesn't look at those young people and say, well, you know, I, 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 they're so young, they're so precious, I don't think I'm going to hurt or touch them. I'm just going to deal with those older ones, you know, the ones who really have it coming. Demons remind us that sin doesn't discriminate. They don't care who they touch or what they touch. Sin doesn't discriminate. And too many of our young people today are overcome and overburdened with sin. The church can win back those young people today by speaking the truth and speaking it in love about the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Righteousness provides boundaries. Righteousness provides a path ahead. It can be very difficult, but righteousness is really what our young people are looking for today. They want a path. They want someone to show them the way. They're, they're crying out for someone to guide them. Church, you and I, we have the words of eternal life. Let's give them and show them the path. I believe Jesus' love and forgiveness will win back our youth today. Before we close this evening, I want to share with you a story. I, I heard it on the radio, and he was a young man, and uh, he wasn't a Christian, but uh, he seemed to have a very fundamentalist uh, Catholic background. And so uh, on the radio, I heard him talking about his experience when he was going into a, a church, and he even admitted, you know, uh, sometimes when I go to the, some of the churches uh, where he, whatever, you know, his true religious background is, he said, sometimes it's like playing Russian roulette. You don't, you don't ever really know what you're going to get. And so he said, when I walked into this place, that's exactly what happened. I, know, I knew that I had lost. Because he said when he walked in, immediately the first thing he saw was what he called the choir or, or jam band. And, uh, and he says that he saw them with their, uh, their shorts and their flip-flops on. And so he uh, walked in and he, and he sat down. He just had a bad feeling this was not going to be good. And uh, sure enough, 
he said as he, he sat down, uh, uh, they began to play something that was kind of like, as he described it, a, a cross between uh, Disney and, and jazz. He didn't know exactly what kind of music it was, but he just knew that it wasn't elevating to God. He knew that it was not bringing him closer to that throne of divinity where he could uh, really set his mind upon God and worship the Lord and the God of heaven above. Then he said the preacher got up and... Uh, you know, the preacher began to uh, tell all these kind of jokes and have all these this kind of references to pop culture. And, and he said, uh, the worst part about it is most of them weren't even good. You know, I like a good joke here and there, but uh, he said most of them weren't even good. He said that the, the preacher there actually at one time made a reference to, to Angry Birds, which he said was kind of outdated for him, even for his time, you know, uh, being a couple years ago. And so this preacher went on and on and, 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 and talked about television shows and all these different things uh, that did not help him to know uh, God any better. And he said the main point of that experience was that uh, it was clear to him, it was clear to him that all of these things that were going on uh, were clearly designed for the young people. But he said, as he's thought about that, he looked across the sea of the, the, the church there and all he could see were the tops of gray heads. He said, clearly all these things were designed for the young people, but none of the young people were there. And he said, yes, there were some young people there, but when he looked over there, all he could really see them, them doing was kind of just cringing with their teeth. Because really it was all just sort of embarrassing. For them. He looked at the older people and they were smiling and they thought it was all cute, but the younger people just kind of embarrassed by everything that was going on. And so anyway, as he went on and described his experience, I think one of the things that I really took away uh, from that was he made the observation that he thinks it really wasn't about getting the young people involved. That wasn't really the problem getting young people. He doesn't believe that getting young people involved today is really the problem, and I don't think so either. I think young people really have an interest in God. I think young people are thirsting and they're hungry for righteousness. I think they have all the same curiosities as man has always had since the beginning. I think young people today, they want to know God. They are thirsting for God. They're thriving for God. They want to know God. They have this spiritual curiosity. They want to know more about the Bible. I think young people today have a sincere interest in God. I believe young people even have a sincere religious devotion to God. They want to, in some way, they want to express that faith and that love that they they have for God. They might not necessarily be doing it according to scripture, but they want to do it. Why? Because man is designed for worship. God designed us and he created us to be a worshipful people. I believe young people want that. They're craving for that. It's not about getting young people involved. But the man said, and I believe he's right, maybe it's more about keeping the older people invested. Maybe it's about keeping many of the older people invested in the truth about Jesus Christ, about the love of the gospel. Oh, that doesn't mean that the young people today, they're not responsible, that they don't share a, a burden and a part in all of this. Absolutely they do. Each of us will give an account. But for many of us who are older, I believe if we want to young, win our young, our young people back today, we need to keep investing in the truth and in the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Maybe tonight as we extend this invitation to Christ Jesus, maybe we can win you, young, you back tonight. Maybe you've uh, left his church. Maybe you need to come back again. Maybe you're kind of walking the fence a little bit. I hope tonight that you know about the truth and about the love of Jesus Christ. I hope that you know that Jesus Christ loves you very much. And if you're that lost sheep tonight, he is seeking and he is searching for you. I hope that you know that you are invited and you are welcome to come tonight. The waters of, bap of baptism are uh, ready and prepared here if you need to receive uh, that baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. If you need prayers of the church, we welcome you tonight as we stand and sing this song together.